Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today in Grand Thornton's budget webinar. Let me first introduce our panel members. I am Vikas Vasan, Managing Partner Tax for Grand Thornton. I have with me Mr. Vishesh Chandyu, CEO, Grand Thornton Bharat. We have with us Dr. Jerji Bhattacharya, who is an eminent digital economist and founder and CEO of Bharat Zap POS. We also have Riyaz Singhna, who focuses on direct taxes, and Krishan Arora, who focuses on indirect taxes. Before we start, what was the background under which this year's budget was presented? Ongoing pandemic for last two years plus, lockdowns, restrictions, economy started recovering, Omicron hit us, state elections on the foresight, lot of expectations from different stakeholders, oil prices rising, central banks across the globe likely to tighten the monetary policies, followed by the announcements recently made by the Fed Reserve in the US. Two schools of thoughts were there. First, government should go for populist measures, leave more money in the hands of the taxpayers, especially the households, give tax concessions, and dole out more tax benefits to the various sections of the society. Second school of thought, stick to the mid to long-term growth agenda and intervene only if necessary, focus on capital formation and infra push. This was a background under which the Honorable Finance Minister presented her budget today morning. The budget lays emphasis on building a strong and robust economy and lays a roadmap for the next 25 years or so. With this, let me invite you, Vishesh, both Grand Thornton Bharat and you have been great proponents of vibrant Bharat. That is supporting the Indian economy, working with the government, partnering with the businesses in building robust businesses, sustainable and which aid to the economic growth. So what's your overall take on the budget today? Yeah, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Vikas. Exactly. That's our purpose at Grand Thornton. We are shaping a more vibrant Bharat, not just a bigger India, but a better India. Right? And I think uh, there's reason for us to be proud after seeing both the economic survey yesterday and the budget today, in my view. And there's, uh, uh, basically, I feel the you know, central theme for me from the last couple of days is, which we should take comfort and confidence in, that India has grown up, is what I'd say. India has grown up. And there's three reasons why I say this. You know, first of all, there's clearly now a focus on agile versus the big bang on one day. Even the economic survey referred to that barbell strategy that they used for pandemic reform, a uh, pandemic response versus a, uh, a waterfall strategy. You know, the strategy more akin to the five-year plans where you you know, make big announcements, make big plans for five years and let it trickle down. Um, and really, we've seen that through 2021. If you go back to the 2021 budget uh, and what happened subsequently, you know, the, of course, the entire PLI scheme was subsequent, you know, to the budget, the big public procurement reform in October 2021. If you go back to June 2021, you had, you know, the announcement of any COVID related receipts that people got uh, from their employers would be tax exempt, right? Whether they lost their life uh, or if it was for COVID reimbursement, it was in June, right? So people, are, so we're no longer waiting for that big bang on one day. It's an agile response on the first point. Second, I'd say the budget is consistent with past years. You can't fault it on simplicity and consistency. There's no changes to tax rates, very much like last year. The focus remains the same on reducing litigation, you know, the two year uh, ability to go back and add to income, you know, reducing, but at least add to income uh, that is now allowed. Enhancing predictability, many, many examples of enhancing predictability for everybody, right? The schemes getting extended on new manufacturing units by a year, startups by, by a year, um, even, you know, the uh, subsequent appeals mechanism. That if something's pending uh, in a higher court, high court or Supreme Court, the department can't, you know, appeal, uh, raise a subsequent appeal on that. Even I'd say the crypto 
tax announcement. While people will say that's a negative, I would say even that leads to higher predictability for everybody versus remaining in the dark. Um, so that's the second point. I'd say consistency with the past. I think the third point I'd say is um, that there wasn't anything massive for farmers or for you know the pole bound states as such as you know that I could notice and no loan waivers, anything off of the sort. And I think you know in a mini election year uh, that ought to be complemented. And I think because of those three things, because of that agile focus versus big bang on the first of Feb, because of that consistency with the past, because of you know the consistency with the same themes of the past budgets, because of you know there's nothing obvious in response to the mini election year, I'd say we should take confidence that India has grown up. Thanks, Vishesh. So three words I'm picking up. Uh, one is pragmatic approach, matured approach, and consistency. I think that's what the theme that you're suggesting the budget has laid out for all of us this year. Jajit, you have been writing a lot about the immense potential which Indian economy has as a digital economy go forward and how it could be a harbinger of change in terms of uplifting the masses. I think this year's budget speech, FM actually started and did a lot of emphasis on building a robust digital infrastructure, whether it is in terms of the K2 education system, whether it is in terms of integrating the post offices, rural upliftment, or even the planned urban development. So what's your take where the budget takes us from here in near future? Well, as you rightly said, um, because that uh, this budget is has actually two themes from the perspective that you're mentioning. One is technology. There seems to be a huge focus on technology. And as Vishesh mentioned, it's a very quick response to the technology. We are not waiting for two years, three years to then take a call on what to uh, respond and how should the government be responding. The budget has enough signals built in as to how the budget, uh, how the government should be responding. One was the taxation of crypto. We may or may not agree with the rates, but there it was a regulatory vacuum which has now been removed. The second big focus is on Atmanirbhar. <clears throat> I think these were the two big focuses that this budget had. Now, if you look at the, the technology part, it's not just digital. <clears throat> They're in fact combining sectors. They're combining <clears throat> agri technology and power generation. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that you must use uh, biomass to as, as a certain percentage of fuel in the coal fired power plant. Now, what does that do? That obviously reduces the cost of generating power, but in tandem, it also creates a market for the, the waste stock that was crea getting created because of uh, you know post harvest which is then getting burned, which would then create the pollution. So you're taking care of pollution. You are taking care of increasing the wealth of the farmers. You're also reducing the cost of power. And those are the technological um, you know, signaling that this budget has been doing. And it's, it's replete with, these, uh, with the, these interventions. If you look at, for example, the modernization of the post office, where the budget talks about connecting it with the banking system in a much more robust manner than what it was earlier. And therefore, for many, many millions who are dependent on the post office for their banking requirements, now they're part of the regular system. They can connect to other banks, they can run some money, which was not happening earlier. If you look at, let's say, clean tech, huge portion, all kinds of clean tech, you know, even if you look at just the battery part of it, the government is not saying, I'll support this technology versus that technology. I will support any technology that's coming into the electric vehicle ecosystem. So if there is battery swapping, the government in this budget is signaling that we will go ahead and support that. We'll in fact even create standards so that battery swapping grows. And in case you know somebody believes that battery swapping is not the way forward, you're free to go ahead and create your own charges and create your own network. If you look at, um, let's say, clean tech from the perspective of uh, solar, the government is pushing and providing incentives for, uh, for domestic manufacturing of the polysilicate uh, material right down to the solar modules and making sure that that whole value chain is uh, based in India, which is also um, a signaling that India is very, very serious about manufacturing in India. And if you see, that's also reflected in the exports that we have. So we, we seem to be as an economy in a very, very comfortable situation. We have a groundbreaking, um, you know, uh, unprecedented export of $400 billion plus of merchandise that will do by the end of this fiscal year in March. 
the total exports will be crossing about $650 billion if you include softwares and so on. Um, if you look at uh, the growth in manufacturing, we have been growing very steadily for the last few months. Services growth has been very, very significant. And therefore, very prudently, the government is not touching anything and disrupting anything with any new, you know, quote unquote, brilliant ideas. It's a business as, as usual, and the interventions are all positive interventions. And, um, you know, coming back to your question in terms of digital, it's now bringing in digital platforms to support all of these entities, even things like passporting. The government has clearly laid out in the budget, they're going to go for e-passports, which makes our life much easier. In fact, there's a separate uh, focus on ease of living, which is something that we all have been asking for uh, for, for, for years. Uh, so many of the digital initiatives and technological initiatives are around these themes of urban, ease of living, ease of doing business. And uh, it's not just a siloed approach. It's a cross-departmental, uh, cross-industry um, uh, approach, which mixes you know, power industry with agriculture, with digital, with startups. And there is a massive amount of incentives and signaling that the government is very serious about technology in every single sector. So, Jaiji, there has been a lot of push on the capital formation this year, and that has continued over the past few years also. We saw FM herself announced that there is about 35% extra allocation this year in terms of the capital expenditure boost in different shapes and formats. Now, this is going to have mid to long term results, but no immediate results. And picking up from what Vishesh also mentioned, that government has adopted a very rational and pragmatic approach, not worrying about the ele forthcoming elections. So how do you see this mid to long term approach also benefiting in the short term on the capital formation? So I think um, to answer that, uh, we need to look at what are the challenges that the government was facing. Um, a thumbs up on the economy, doing well uh, at this stage, uh, post the pandemic. A thumbs up in terms of the government's collections, uh, record-breaking collections, uh, 1.3 lakh crore of uh, GST. Um, I think for the last six, seven months, we have been clocking more than 1 lakh crore every month of GST collection, which is fantastic. So a big positive on the economy, big positive on exports, big positive on our Forex reserves. We have Forex reserves, which uh, support 13 months of import. If you compare that 1991, we had 13 days of import left, uh, and now we've got 13 months of import left. So all positive. So what is it that the government is trying to solve is there's still a huge rural stress. The poor are getting impacted. In fact, if you look at the labor participation, it's less than 41%. It's probably one of the lowest in any large economy in the world, uh, largely contributed by uh, COVID. And that is where we need to ensure that we, we inject money into this segment, create demand, and ensure that they have a livelihood in a sustainable manner. Now, if I say that, and if you look at the budget, it looks a bit contradictory because, um, you know, as I was discussing with Vishesh a little before this conversation started, there is a cut of 20,000 crores in the Mandrega plan. Uh, and so it looks very contradictory as to why the government looking at the problem of uh, very poor labor participation is having a 20,000 crore in uh, cut in Mandrega. That's because the government believes that it is far more productive to put that money into actually building capital, right? And that's uh, to your question because that we see a massive 34.5% increase in capital layout about a whopping, whopping 7 lakh crore uh, that will be spent uh, in the coming fiscal year. And uh, if you look at what the government is promising, they're giving very specific numbers, 25,000 kilometers of highways being rolled out in the next 365 days, which means more than 70 kilometers of highways happening per day, which is a number that even China never matched. I mean, China was around 30, 35 kilometers at its, uh, at its peak. So doing 70 kilometers per day, doing the river linking, um, uh, building all the other assets we're talking about, which is upgrading the Aganwadis, massive amount of upgradation of Aganwadis, increasing the quality of those uh, you know, institutions, which are important for uh, our human resources, our children. All of that will lead to significant amount of uh, jobs getting created. And on top of it, it will be a very productive uh, outlay of the money, which means that the multiplier effect will be very, very significant. Now, we do know that for roads, the multiplier effect is approximately 2.1%. So if these 25,000 kilometers of roadways getting built, 
a large number of people will get jobs opposed to only spending that money in manrega where the multiplier effect is extremely low mm-hmm. so the capital formation becomes an, an extremely important part of what the government is doing also keeping in mind that the government is also moving into asset recycling which means a lot of the capital that was created earlier is now being recycled into another kind of capital because either those capitals are unproductive or those uh, those kind of assets is not what the government should be into and i think one of the headlines is the fact that they're going to do an ipo of lic which is going to be perhaps the largest ipo that this country would have seen and that's going to help uh, in the receipts of uh, the government and probably moving forward and i'm hoping that moving forward all the roads that are being built is then pushed into asset recycling so that there is a vibrant private sector which jumps in and takes up these assets which are minus all the risks that are there if the private sector is involved directly interesting a lot of money to be uh, monetized go forward uh, riyas on the direct taxes front uh, if there is one thing that we have seen was the consistency in tax policy no major changes barring the uh, introduction of the new tax regime on cryptocurrency which i am sure vishesh and jayjit will be very happy because they are happy paying taxes on that subject so they would like to know what's there in the fine print for the virtual digital currencies even though incidentally there was no mention yesterday in the economic survey so there was some skepticism in the last 24 hours whether there will be some announcements coming on that but fortunately there is some clarity now so we will love to hear what's there in the fine print on virtual digital currency riyas from you. sure thanks uh, vikas in fact you are absolutely right uh, it is a very welcome move that uh, there have been there's been some clarity on uh, the virtual cryptocurrency side there's been a lot of speculation over a long period of time on how it goes so two things have happened on the cryptocurrency front number one is that the government has announced a digital virtual currency which is going to be rolled out uh, in 2223 so that that is uh, definitely a step in the right direction on the tax side the much needed clarity has been provided now whether you like it or not whether you find it uh, too uh, burdensome or very welcome whatever it is there is a clarity which has been provided and i think that is uh, extremely welcome so now what will happen is that under the new regime any transfer of a virtual digital asset will be subject to tax at the rate of 30% transfer so it's quite wide transfer will include everything it will even include gifts if you actually gift it within the family too there will be a tax which will be levy there will be no expenses which will be allowed against uh, uh, the profit so except for the cost of acquisition there will be no set off of losses and at the end to try and uh, ensure that it falls within the tax net, tax net there will be a 1% tbs which will be uh, brought in uh, to be paid by the buyer it leads to a lot of questions so uh, on how some of the things will be done and we shall find out in due course so for example uh, who is a buyer if it is transferred on the exchange how does a monitor those transfers you know it can be uh, done uh, in a digital wallet form it can be done through an exchange so we really don't know how the monetizing is going to happen but at least now there is a clarity on what should be the tax and a 30% maybe a little uh, expensive but i think it uh, the clarity it was very much needed and i think uh, it, it's come at an opportune time and i think there is also a mention riyas that uh, losses if any incurred will not be allowed to be set off against other income that's so right it, it's clearly being put as a speculative income and you have to pay taxes at the highest rate and maybe Inca, think, uh, yeah go ahead you know i think uh, you're right that it is going against uh, as a speculative asset and that's exactly how the government has decided to treat it and uh, i think it is on par and therefore no losses no expenses but uh, it, it to a large extent it is speculative in nature so i think it goes with the theme yes sir no i want to make a comment on the central bank digital currency 
you know, the RBI has run, been running a pilot project, just like I think 70, 80 countries in the world, and about seven, eight countries already launched their own digital currencies. So but at least now there's certainty that in the coming fiscal, we will have an Indian rupee-backed uh, uh, crypto. And I guess, uh, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya will want to come in uh, on this also. It impacts his business directly, it's his space. Uh, but I think the disruption that will cause and the opportunities it will create will be tremendous, right? Just imagine the entire ATM network, uh, the entire payment space, the entire cash handling space, uh, how all that will get, will get disrupted. Uh, we've seen how you know, digital payments have picked up post-pandemic. Uh, you know, and I really feel that's a, uh, you know, a seminal moment for the country. Jaijit? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, uh, Vishesh. Uh, I think absolutely bang on. And also the impact on uh, the rural economy, because as of now, we are very um, you know, conveniently doing UPI transactions in the urban areas. But in the rural areas, it doesn't work. We don't have the connectivity. So with, um, uh, with, with, the, with the digital currency coming in, you can actually transfer the money from phone to phone without a, a backend connectivity, which is going to be quite transformational. Great. Great boost to your business as well. Uh, JD on this side. So, uh, Riaz, uh, one more thing that the government has been doing is, and uh, kudos to the various sections of the government in terms of spearheading that, is to cut down on the litigation. Uh, in the past, the limits have been increased uh, below which the tax authorities were barred from filing in appeals. Then we saw two set of dispute resolution schemes on direct taxes as well as the indirect taxes. And now, continuing with this step forward, there have been certain announcements in order to cut down on the repetitive litigation, especially if the cases are pending with high courts and Supreme Courts. I think we would like to know more about that. Yeah, uh, because on the litigation management side, I think there have been two separate approaches which the budget has uh, proposed. So the first one is reintroduction of a kind of a revised income, uh, re revised return scheme that we used to have before. So now what has been proposed is that if any income has escaped being reported in the past, you have a period of 24 months within which you can actually uh, revise. There'll be a new return form which will come in where you can include this uh, uh, income and that will ease the entire procedural hassles that one faced when there were genuine errors which came. Of course, that comes at a cost. So there will be an additional tax which will be paid. So it'll be 25% if you do it in the first year uh, and provided your original return was filed on time and 50% if you do it in year two. So there will be a cost, but with that, it will really uh, ease the procedural uh, hardship in uh, correcting genuine mistakes also. There will be a few uh, gray areas which will also come in over there, which we'll have to see how they uh, merge out. So uh, if assessments have already been uh, completed, <clears throat> then it may not be possible to revise unless and until it was done under a, a, you know, a, 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 a primary assessment, which is just a processing of the return if that has been done. And another area which we need to look at, and let's see how it emerges, is whether the penal provisions can still be uh, attracted even after you have declared there, because there is a silence at the moment on that aspect. So that is one part where litigation management is uh, coming, and I think it's welcome. The second one is what you were referring to uh, on repetitive appeals. And yes, now, now, what has been provided is if there is an appeal pending before the Supreme Court or the High Court, and that uh, your case, it may not be your own appeal, but if it, your case is uh, exactly similar on the question of law, in that case, the uh, you know the collegium which will be a uh, collegium which will be built up of uh, CITs and chief commissioners they'll determine whether the case uh, is identical and if it is identical they can instruct the CIT who in turn the jurisdictional CIT who can in turn uh, direct the assessing officer 
not to file further appeals and uh, just wait till the final decision of that uh, case will come in through the Supreme Court or the High Court. Now, this is extremely welcome. It will reduce the number of uh, appeals, but there may be uh, a double-edged sword there also because if a decision uh, comes in and your case had not been taken up, it will be open to the assessing officers to apply into your case also. A good thing is that while the collegium can take that decision, the assessee has the right whether to agree or disagree as to whether the question of law is identical or not. So it is not an arbitrary power there. And that is, again, a good, a good thing that has happened. So the, these two steps both will go and uh, reduce the level of litigation significantly. And I think they're both very welcome. And great, well, yeah. yeah. Great welcome moves Diaz on this count, but I think there were clearly two misses which people expected. One was that there could be some announcements on the mediation kind of a scheme. And second was that uh, board for advanced ruling should be made fully functional and its con constitution should be made independent of not only just the revenue official. So I think that's a part which probably the industry will continue to voice its concerns and maybe it will get addressed over a period of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So, Christian, changing tracks, uh, rationalization of different regimes and simplification has been the key mantra which the government has been working on. And this year on expected lines, we see a lot of things happening on the fine print on custom side uh, in terms of the various exemptions and reductions which were there and also rationalization of the various rates. We saw changes in customs being made a couple of years back when the rate structures were rationalized and it was a very welcome move. After that, even the disputes and litigation have gone down. What's your take on the custom side in this year's budget? Thanks, Vikas. Uh, you know, customs administration in the country actually has been totally revamped in the past few years and we can see that. Faceless customs is now the fully established ice gate portal of customs, which is the backbone of the faceless establishment. These reforms which have happened over a period of time and this year actually will not even not only assist the domestic capacity creation and enhancing the ease of doing business, but they will also act as an enabler in the overall policy initiatives such as PLI and phase manufacturing under the Make in India campaign. Now, numerous amendments have been proposed on the custom front, but uh, talking about some of the significant ones in terms of the rationale is that a uh, lot of, you know, like you rightly mentioned, a lot of revamping of uh, the duty rates, inverted duty structure has already been done in the last couple of years. But what, what really was required now is to reassess where are the exemptions required? And in fact, uh, are these exemptions required now with the Make in India initiative and the PLI being uh, introduced where domestic manufacturing is being encouraged and there should be not too much dependency on imports from countries like China. So in that, I think in, that is the theme at which the customs revamping of the rates has been done again and over 350 exemption entries have been reviewed again. And major part of that is that wherever required, dependency on import should be minimal to the critical raw material. And at the same time, manufacture as much as possible at the best competitive rates uh, by paying those appropriate duties and taxes within India and try to be more indigenously dependent. Now, most of these exemptions which have actually happened, uh, you know, have been taken away are the ones where India has actually matured or grown as Vishesh mentioned to the level of that manufacturing capability and having that specialization built in India and not being dependent on the import front. So actually the FM you know, proposed to do away with these exemptions on that theme and various across sectors like agriculture produce, chemicals, fabrics, medical devices, uh, all these areas sufficient domestic capability now exists. And that is why the government actually after having extensive consultations with the industry and even crowdsourcing has come out with the further revamping of these exemptions. I would say pruning of the exemptions, pruning of uh, you know customs concessional duty rates in wherever required, as also large project imports and capital intensive activities where the taxes were actually exempted are no more required to be exempted. So that is what has happened, and wherever required, the duties also have been you know reduced only to cater to the fact that these are raw materials or these are components which are critically required in manufacturing space in India and are not abundantly available in India. So I believe that gradually doing away with these exemption entries in different sectors, 
where domestic manufacturing capability has reached a minimum threshold is a very welcome move. The proposal of rejigging the custom duty structure in critical sectors would actually provide that impetus or to the growth of the Indian economy. So overall, uh, Art Nirbhar Bharat and domestic manufacturing and building the capacity in India is yielding results. And that was also one of the trigger points why there has been so much racialization this year in the customs duties. Absolutely. Uh, so Krishan, uh, generally we have seen that uh, Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Commerce have been, uh, have been at divergent views as far as SEZ policy has been concerned. And uh, uh, it's a no brainer uh, that they have in certain divergent views expressed in public as well at different forms. However, in the last couple of months, we saw a consistent one voice coming from both the ministries that yes, this is one area where we have reached a consensus and there will be a rejig in the policy. And that's exactly what we saw today in the announcements. So what do you foresee in terms of the SEZ policy going forward? You know, because the SEZ actually, you know, this is a very, very big issue and a burning issue, which the you know industry has been talking about the SEZ, you know, development uh, authorities, the SEZ uh, infrastructure has been lying vacant. Uh, they've been waiting eagerly for this, you know, this alignment actually of the provisions of, you know, customs and SEZ having everything now driven on technology on the ice gate portal where, you know, there was so much manual operational issues which were being faced different practices being adopted by different jurisdictions. Most of it was happening because this was not regulated in that manner in which it was supposed to be. And that's the reason the challenges which got created actually led to the fact that a lot of units started exiting the SEZ space and also because there was no direct tax benefit left. Now, what holds you to continue with such a large massive infrastructure which you've created across India on a, in you know with you what you call as a you know friendly jurisdiction tax friendly jurisdiction of of SEZ and what happens to such jurisdictions once a direct tax benefit is taken away now all these benefits you know and and on top of that uh, in DTA it was easy to set up custom bonded warehouses where duty deferral is provided PLI schemes are available across the board to manufacturers irrespective of where you are situated. And now, because of all these areas, you know, people felt that SEZs are no more, you know, uh, really workable for us, you know, barring that uh, fact that uh, they provide some duty benefits to you. But other than that, everything was basically going in operational challenges, the lack of consistency in terms of operationalizing things. And also in the pandemic time, we saw a lot of issues in relation to work from home, etc., which were being talked about, but not, not being addressed. So I think it's a very, very important and timely move which will actually enable a revival of the SEZs. Now, when we talk about this today, about 40 to 50% of the SEZ area is lying vacant. That is shocking. And if it, this was a big worry for the developers as well as the logistics and the infrastructure support players, which had made you know, their base depending upon SEZ and proximity to that. Now, with the replacement of this registration, I think also with the changes which will be happening to make a fully IT driven partnership with customs administration and provisions through IceGate will enable that much needed ease of actually operating under an SEZ model, which was a big task and a big ask as well. And these changes would be very beneficial to the SEZ industry. It will boost not only the competitiveness of the exports globally, it will also increase the ease of doing business as I talked about, utilize the available infrastructure, which is abundantly available without doing anything. And so many of the initiatives which government is taking needs infrastructure to be developed, it is already available. I think that's probably, I would say, is a great budget booster shot for the units which are currently operating, as well as for the new entrants, which will now reconsider or consider entering into the SEZ space. And I think just to add to that one point, because is that now the with the lot debt rates also being announced for the DTA, and now the government is very positive uh, with the fact that raw debt rates will also be now applicable to the SEZ units, I think that will create that icing on the cake, which which will probably help the complete uh, you know relook at the way people look at SEZ. I think it will be only interesting to see how the revamped legislation will also bring in the involvement of the states. The finance minister talked about the state's involvement in terms of the SEZ, while it's a central law, that is something which probably will have to you know look, we'll have to look at their right. involvement and what is the importance of states partnering in this initiative with the with the, with the SEZ at the center. 
absolutely a positive move on scz we will have to look into the fine prints hopefully we will learn from the best global practices now like life where everything cannot be a bed of roses so is the case with the economy and the budget as well jaji there are two clear headwinds which we are looking at in the global economy one is the rising inflation uh, and oil prices are also rising now almost touching 90 dollars a barrel and second is the tightening monetary policy which will squeeze in the liquidity uh, or Uh, by the various central banks i think it will start with the fed reserve and then followed by others how much impact do you see it will have on india having said that we have robust foreign exchange reserves exports are all time high and revenue collections are also looking good at least in the last two quarters both direct tax and indirect tax have done fairly well what's your take how much impact it is likely to have on the indian economy yeah i think very important point uh, because you mentioned about uh, the inflation because that is really the bugbear if you look at uh, the wpi it has been stubbornly higher you know reaching double digits and staying at double digits for a really long time <clears throat> and um, if you look at it from the context of um, the the vulnerable sections of the society it's really going to impact them now inflation and energy prices go hand in hand one of the reasons that the inflation has happened is also because you know food travels on top of um, you know diesel if the diesel prices go up the energy prices goes up the food prices goes up and that is a very large part of our inflation calculation bucket <clears throat> in in addition if you look at um, the uh, the core lending rates of rbi it is at a historic low, you know low rate of 4% so obviously those low rates have also contributed to inflation now is the inflation because there is a lot of money floating around is it because there is a significant reduction in demand uh it probably looks like there is a significant reduction in demand that has happened um also but <clears throat> also because um the productivity has gone down uh, massively uh, as i mentioned a little while ago that the labor participation rate is at a historic low of less than 41% so if people are not working people are not producing either right and if they are not producing then that's also contributing to the inflation happening and therefore if you look at the numbers now coming in where the manufacturing is picking up services picking up hopefully it will uh, lead to some easing of the inflation that we are seeing um but in tandem if you look at the geopolitical events that are showing up the conflict between uh, ukraine and uh, and russia which falls right in the middle of the energy network um it seems to be a challenging environment frankly because uh, because uh if that conflict really blows up it'll have an impact on the oil prices if there is an impact on the oil prices then no matter how much of manufacturing we crank up we will have an impact on inflation having said that um what is it that we can do from an economic perspective what is it that the government can do uh, from an economic perspective and is the fed really tightening up uh if the fed starts tightening up at this stage a um, lot of economies get hit um the us economy itself will get hit so it's a question mark it has been um, you know hanging for a long time that will they won't they uh it seems that uh, at least for a quarter or so more they will not indulge in any more tightening and maybe two to three quarters from now they might start doing the tightening uh and they will read the tea leaves they will read what's going on at that point in time before uh, you know uh, tightening uh, the fed rates because if they do so it's going to impact most nations in the world and that's going to impact back the economy of us so it will have larger ramifications which i'm sure the fed will look into before tightening up so i think in conclusion quite a few factors are playing out that the geopolitics is playing out our own ability to get the 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 labor uh, come back and be productive and therefore crank up our manufacturing and services even more and lastly the fed rates uh, and uh, the rbi's response to the fed rates uh, clearly the rbi is in no position to relax its uh, rates any more and it shouldn't because that will fuel uh, the the inflation even more um and if we um, you know if we try to tighten any further it will have an impact on uh, the growth also so it's a fine balancing act um, too many factors going around uh, vikas so i think it's worth watching what happens in the in the next few quarters 
So Jajit, I'm sure the pensioners and the conservative investors will feel happy if the interest rates are going to go up as they generally keep their money in the FDs. Whereas people investing in the stock markets are also a little relaxed right now because uh, whatever FIIs are pulling out, DIIs, the domestic investors and the domestic institutions are putting in that much money, but time will tell uh, when the rubber hits the road and the interest rates globally start going up. Uh, Riaz, let me change tracks and come back to you on the direct taxes. There was an important clarification or an announcement made by the finance minister today that cess and surcharge are akin to income taxes and they are not tax deductible. There has been a lot of litigation going on on that. I think this is an important clarification. Your take on that? Yes, there have been two or three silent uh, uh, you know, uh, announcements made by the finance minister, which didn't really uh, get too much of, uh, you know, notice, uh, where, in fact, uh, it, they have all been designed to take care of addressing certain uh, court decisions, which had kind of the litigation which had gone in favor of assessees to take care of that, two or three things have been done. And one of them, of course, has been on education uh, cess. And uh, while it was very clear that income tax is not a deductible expense, and that is very much a part of the law uh, from the beginning, uh, since education says and health says and all had been brought in for a specific purpose that had been claimed as expense by various uh, uh, corporate houses, uh, various businesses saying that this is not a tax, but it is actually a cost which comes in to take care of a particular expense. And there had been uh, a few decisions which had been going in favor of the assessees. And therefore now the clarification has come in by the finance minister saying that that was never the intention of the legislature. And therefore very clearly education says, et cetera, will not be treated as a business expense. While they were doing that, they've also introduced um, uh, another uh, silent uh, amendment and that was uh, you know in terms of interest payments so uh, as as you're aware that interest uh, payment will be allowed as a deduction in the year in which the payment is actually made and uh, tax will be deducted uh, one of the instruments which uh, which had been used was to convert such interest into debentures and conversion of interest into debentures was treated as a payment of interest and therefore uh, no uh, deduction, uh, the, the, no disallowance under the 40, section 43B should be permitted. Now again, uh, and in fact, there was a Supreme Court decision which took care uh, of uh, that particular uh, position and had actually ruled that conversion into debentures would be uh, treated as a payment of interest. Now again, uh, the provision has been made to clarify that such conversion would not be treated as interest. In fact, it overturns the decision of the Supreme Court. So both these things have been brought up. Yes. Right, yes. Let me put you in a spot on a question on cess and surcharge. Traditionally, the very meaning of cess and surcharge has been that they are implemented or imposed to meet some specific purpose for a specific period of time. But I think psychologically now we are used to having this cess and surcharge uh, year on year basis. Do you think in near future the government should withdraw this? Because these are adding not only to the tax burden, but also to the compliances, especially when you have to compute various tax rates on TDS, et cetera. Uh, it's only adding to the complication. Whereas education says or healthcare cess and surcharge all were introduced for a specific period, should be there for a limited period of time. Probably it's time in the forthcoming budgets to withdraw. Your take on that? No, uh, absolutely right. Uh, because and there's been a statement that we uh, there's been a you know a call for removal of this cess and surcharge over a period of time. But it is a uh, good revenue to collect. And of course, what happens is that the purpose may keep changing, but the cess will actually uh, remain. So education says and higher education says, and then you could have another higher, higher, higher education says. So therefore, uh, while it is definitely uh, desirable 
that uh, says and surcharge should be there for a limited period and should not continue. But I think over a period of time, consecutive uh, finance ministers have been uh, have taken that as a part of your normal direct tax revenue, and I don't see that going away in a hurry. So I think the only positive that we see in this is there was no new tax, no new COVID surcharge this year. Great. Uh, Vishesh, you have been uh, part of the various business chambers since morning, since the budget was presented. Of course, most of the announcements are long-term growth story. Is there a that probably there were certain sections, especially the contact industries, et cetera, which required some support or the MSs which required some support? Anything which, which, which you feel the industry feels is a miss right now? I think generally, everybody would agree that you know, we've seen a tremendous economic recovery out of the pandemic. But if you look within that, it's been a K-shaped recovery, right? Mm -hmm. The bigger companies, the rich have become richer. Uh, and you know, at the same time, there has been an impact on high-touch industries, on you know, MSMEs across industries. And those are the bottom of the pyramid. And therefore, whilst monetary space is constrained, like Jajit was saying, and with inflation where it is, with expectations on oil, 85% of our crude is imported, we don't have much room on monetary policy. Looking at the GST collections, corporate tax collections, uh, uh, personal tax collections, which are up 50% to November, April to November, corporate tax within that is up 90%. There was an expectation that fiscal space is available to be able to look at that basic you know, exemption limit of two and a half lakhs to look at the maximum rate being applicable from 10 lakhs on the personal tax side, right? And, and enhancing that a little bit. So I think there was that expectation that those are the bottom of the pyramid. Of course, if you ask the regime, they would say not tweaking rates, you know, that consistency um, is, is what they'd rather stick with. And what they've done is, you know, things like the MSME, uh, emergency credit uh, guarantee line, right? They've extended that further by a year and by 50,000 crores to five lakh crores now. So uh, so there are bits and pieces that are there, but I, I really, uh, really think there was an expectation. Somebody, but my expectation was that they will, be, they will prefer consistency, no change to taxes, but there was a general expectation that something would be, will be done there. I, I, I felt that because... You know, again, if you look at the economic survey yesterday, it talked about eight to eight and a half percent FY23 growth. You know, when the IMF and everybody else is talking about nine percent plus growth, I thought that was a hint enough that you know we will see more, uh, you know, more of an eye on the fiscal deficit versus uh, you know relaxation on rates and stuff. So, Vishesh, uh, if I have one takeaway from what you just said, is probably the expectation was there in certain quarters that there will be some intervention, especially from the households, that just like the corporates got a great deal in terms of 15% and 22% tax rates earlier, uh, maybe that's that's a, that's the top of the budget for 2024 when we go for the next union elections. Uh, anyway, uh, yes, yeah, Riaz, yeah, yes, coming to you quickly yeah. on the IFSC, there are certain tax announcements over there, India's endeavor to make, uh, bring India at par with some of the financial centers, whether it is New York, London, Dubai, Singapore, etc., is paving way now with a lot of tax and regulatory concession. And there is something in the fine print as well this year. Sure. Yeah. So before I go to that, just to add to what uh, Vishesh was saying, there were a few uh, expectations. Also, one of the expectations was a boost to the service uh, industry. So this, uh, you know, the corporate tax rate of 15%, the special ones which is available for manufacturing, it was expected that it would be extended to the service sector. Uh, that uh, somehow did not uh, happen. So I think that is one additional miss besides all, uh, all the expectations on the personal tax side that we said. So just wanted to add that. Uh, coming to the IFSC, yes, uh, see, over the last uh, uh, couple of years, there has been a clear focus of the government to make IFSC a success and really make it, uh, make the center in line with uh, you know, international practices. So even, uh, and, and in fact, you've seen that even in our interactions, there's a lot of agility in, uh, uh, with the IFSC. Uh, authorities in adapting to business needs 
uh, across the board. So in the budget, again, I think there have been three basic announcements which have come in, which, which are very positive. One of them is uh, setting up an international arbitration uh, center in IFS. I think that is a very, very positive uh, move. Uh, it is uh, in line with uh, all our international uh, practices, and it would give a lot of confidence to international investors. That has been combined with also inviting uh, various uh, you know, in, uh, educational institutions and universities to establish base there to uh, also create the skilling that is required. So I think both these moves are on the structural side. On the tax side, also there have been a couple of moves. So the first one is, um, you know, there's a tax exemption which has been uh, provided now for any income which is earned by non-residents from uh, portfolio investments in securities outside India, if it is handled by a PMS established in the IFSC. Now, I think that is really a very uh, positive move. It will give an impetus for more and more PMSs dealing in securities, uh, international securities to set up base there. Now, whether it will also have an impact or some of the PMSs established in India dealing with uh, overseas securities to move to IFSC, we have to see, but I think that is an extremely positive uh, uh, step that has been uh, brought in. Uh, one more step which has uh, been brought in is uh, encouraging the uh, banking units which have been set up in uh, IFSC. So now an exemption is being provided on income which is earned by any non-resident for transfer of uh, you know, derivative instruments with uh, banking units set up in IFSC. Now this will actually encourage, in, in the recent past, we have been seeing a lot of interest by banking units to set up uh, their branches and banking units in IFSC. I think this will also further uh, help in trying to make it a more attractive uh, proposition. So I think all this, uh, all these three things that come to mind are extremely positive for the IFSC in this city. So over a period of time, IFSs have been gaining traction and rightly so because of the various tax and regulatory positive changes being brought in. And Riyas, uh, your first point on the services sector side, before I ask Krishan to go and make a strong representation on behalf of the services sector, to reduce the GST rate of 18% and it benefits us as well. Vishen, uh, it was interesting to see Honorable Finance Minister making a departure from the speech and picking up a piece of paper in the, on the floor of the house and stating that January has been an exceptional month in terms of the GST collections. Kudos to the government, kudos to the bureaucracy, thanks to the tax technology being introduced, GST is up on the rise. Uh, now call it in terms of the technological interventions, uh, supervision, et cetera, et cetera. What's your take? Is it the right time for the government to rationalize the tax rates and go for GST 2.0? What's your take on that? So, Vikas, absolutely. I think it was remarkable that uh, in spite of the rise in um, you know, COVID cases, the resultant shutdown of businesses, the government actually was able to witness this record collection of over 1.40 you know, uh, crores uh, one lakh crores, uh, and actually, if you look at the trends, they've been able to maintain an average of about 115,000 lakh crores of uh, GST revenue over the last fiscal. Most major portion of that, that is that is commendable. Uh, I think the claim which was made today, I think that was worth mentioning. But also, you know, these are timelines where the GST annual filings or the reconciliations are going on. The timelines got extended you know, uh, coincidentally to 31st of January. So some of the corrections also could have pertained to that. And as also, you know, on when you're talking about, you know, eligibility of credit payment of, you know, taxes, which have been identified, not having been paid earlier. Um, and, uh, you know, nothing to be reported on provisional basis. Recently also, there have been changes in the GST system and the filings that all the information on the credit will be actually relied upon, which is available in your portal. Nothing on provisional basis will be available to you, even if you paid something to the supplier. I think that is probably what I would want to be seeing as an interesting factor of whether this trend will continue or not, and whether it actually pertains to the economic growth 
or it is a combination of both. I think time would tell. Probably the next few months will be critical to look at that as we are closing this financial year. But a very positive trend has been seen any which way in the manner in which the compliance framework is now becoming more transparent. The tax technology has taken over significantly in the processes which the government is running, and those are now very clearly known to the assessees, and nothing remains hidden. That. if you don't have robust compliances or you know your compliance and your id systems are not working in tandem you will not tend to lose not only the tax you know credits you will tend to lose uh, on interest penal consequences and as recent as about couple of days back now they have also put in information which is now giving you automated data that you don't have to rely upon the data which is being supplied by the supplier or not supplied it is there on your system which was a large part of you know ambiguity when i used to claim as a, as a recipient all my tax credits now that information is there in your portal you don't have a choice and you cannot have that you know end up into litigation and say oh like listen i have paid this money but i don't know if supplier has paid that money to the government now that is all there in front of you if you know it claim it as per what is available do not try to you know make advantage or take advantage of the system i think that was one thing which came out of that the second part probably is that the systems i think the analytics has gone to a level that anti evasion measures and the manner in which the authorities are now looking at you know looking at uh, all the businesses how they are behaving is all available in the system you cannot you know have any information which is not transparently available the analytics between the mou which has been signed with the cbic and the cbdt for sharing information the business intelligence and fraud analytics the bifa tool which the government has adopted i think these are very you know clear in terms of what the what government is really asking for clean simple compliance take what you are entitled to do not take advantage of any anomaly other than the fact that there are interpretational issues etc which could be there which can be addressed over a period of time right. with the gst council i think that is what has happened but at the same time now government is also giving you ease of transferring your cash balances of one state to another balance the central balances of cgst igst and that's a very welcome move you could be claiming refunds in one state because you have excess gst lying there and you have to pay cash in another state because there is no ample you know gst credit available to you there or the cash balance now government is actually come in with a facilitation measure that you can actually transfer the cgst and the igst balance lying in one state to use in another state i think that is very very Yeah. positive move as such which has happened so similar to that certain administrative facilitation measures have happened i think very positive the the gst law is here to stay and is going to go a big way in terms of how you will look at automation of compliances and how people look at it as a law because before you sign off uh, I, i know you're coming to the end of time but since krishan didn't make the pitch i i better do that you know just like there's the road tax scheme for products and goods there was an expectation of an extension on the SCIS scheme, you know, service export from India scheme, which you know finished in 2020, FY20, and even the you know categories have gone down, uh, you know, of that scheme. And I I really feel that uh, is something that ought to be you know brought back on the table because service exports are so important to our service sector growth, which is so important, being you know 65 percent plus of our economy to the overall growth of the economy. I agree, Vishesh. And I think one more point, uh, picking up from what you and Krishan just mentioned, in terms of the digitization and sharing of information and availability of information with the government, I think government should also look at the rationalization of the TDS regime. We, as a firm, had done one study wherein about four sections contribute almost eighty percent to the TDS contribution. whereas we have more than three dozen sections which are only adding to the complexities may not be in this year's budget but go forward i think there is a need for rationalization because industry is looking at it and it unnecessarily results into disputes and litigation we have lot of questions coming in and it's been a very interesting discussion uh, but we are at the top of the hour i want to thank all my panelists vishesh jayjit riyas krishan very interesting discussion we had a great budget session today uh, in fact the announcements made by the honorable finance minister clearly lay out a road map for robust and strong growth in the economy as we go along lot of push on the infrastructure side and lot of hopes and aspirations arising with this year's budget thank you to all the viewers for joining us